Hi, very good morning. I am Dr. Janak Patel, MD, General Physician. All my video lectures are mainly for educative purpose. In continuity with the previous lecture series in Neurology, today I am going to discuss regarding one of the very useful topic you will see in your everyday practice also can be asked in your oral as well as in your theory exam that is anisocoria or we call unequal pupil some of the video clips which I have added in this particular lecture I have collected from YouTube I am very much thankful to those people who has uploaded those video lectures and I'm utilizing that for educative purpose only. So you can clearly see here the size of the pupil is unequal. Here also you can see that size of the pupil on dark room is unequal and that is called anisocoria, unequal pupil when both pupil are exposed to the same amount of light. Here you can see this is a normal pupil. This is abnormal pupil. At the room light, both appears nearly same. At bright light, both appears nearly same. But in a dark room, you can see this does not dilate completely. This is fully dilated. So this is abnormal pupil and this will call as anisocoria so now i am showing a first clip on anisocoria just listen properly sorry this is not working so i'll be going to another part that is anisocoria in a room light both pupil reacts to light. If answer is yes, examine in a dim light. And if answer is no, then we'll proceed further. So first I'm going to this side. A pupil is reacting to light. And now we are exposing in a dim light. Now any socoria has increased. If answer is yes, it is probably Horner syndrome. And if answer is no, on exposure to dim light, pupils will dilate. And if there is no increase in anisocoria, that is by and large physiological. It is not pathological. Now what is happening to the Horner syndrome? Whenever you are exposing to a dim light, the pupil dilation does not take place. If answer is yes, it is probably Horner syndrome. And then you can add 5 to 10 percent cocaine drops, anisocoria increases, and pupil fails to dilate. Answer is yes, it confirms the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. Wait for 24 to 48 hours and then you can do the test with hydroxyampetamine. And if the small pupil dilates, answer is yes, it is preganglionic corners. And if it does not dilate, then it is a postganglionic that is third order neuron. This will be a very simple mode by which you can identify Horner syndrome as well as by doing a hydroxyempetamine test, you will be able to differentiate whether it is a preganglionic or a postganglionic. Now if both pupil reacts to light, if answer is no, then small pupil and large pupil. Now in a small pupil reacts to Uh, accommodation response. 
so accommodation response preserved it will be ar pupil if accommodation is not preserved it will be iris dysfunction say large pupil is reacting it reacts to accommodation response it is more in favor of home and this pupil and it reacts to answer is no it does not react then you add pilocarpy and if it reacts it is a third cranial nerve palsy and if there is no it is a pharmacological blockage so this will be the way you can proceed in anisocoria there is another way in anisocoria anisocoria if it increases in dark then you can go for a test it is called apraclodidin test if dilation is poor dilation lag is there then you add 1% apraclodin and if it is positive it is definitely in favor of hornus we already mentioned before and then you can do phenylephrine test or you can add amphetamine 10% hydroxy amphetamine and then you can find out what is pre ganglionic or post ganglionic and if it there is no dilation lag then it is a simple anisocoria or we call physiological and if anisocoria is greater in the light then you can go for identification of third cranial nerve palsy or pharmacological midriasis or iris damage same like the previous slide so two different slides you can go through at your leisure time we'll be going through other groups that is horner syndrome home edis pupil third cranial nerve palsy and ar pupil main common which can be asked to you in your oral also as well as in theory so horner syndrome is classified by or it is characterized by meiosis that is pinpoint pupil ptosis which is because of the involvement of the molar muscle molar muscle is supplied by sympathetic fiber and hydrosis on the side of the damage anophthalmos flushing of the face absence of ciliospinal reflex and does not dilate with 4% cocaine and the lower eyelid is little bit elevated we call as a reverse ptosis when all these findings are together we we'll label that as a horner syndrome but characteristics ptosis and hydrosis and meiosis these are the three classical feature which will pinpoint that it is more in favor of horner syndrome ptosis and hydrosis and meiosis this is also not working sorry absolutely sorry so home edis pupil it is classical in case of myotonica congenita it is also called as a myotonic pupil or edis pupil or edis syndrome you will have a unilateral dilated pupil pupillary reflex is absent and the response is very slow or we call poor response poor response to convergence so when a person tries to do a convergence or we call accommodation as a poor response and it will constrict with a weak pilocarpy this is a characteristic of a myotonic pupil or we call home edis pupil as well as in this syndrome you will have a reduced tendon reflex particularly knee and ankle will be reduced and person may have even orthostatic hypotension so typical pupil you will have a dilated pupil in dark in a bright light the pupil will remain dilated in a near light it will constrict and to the pilocarpy it will dilate slowly we already mentioned poor response 
constricts with a weak pillow carpi. So you can see that it constricts with a weak pillow, pillow carpi drops. So normally the pupil is little dilated and it will respond to pillow carpi. I don't know what has happened. I'll show you later on. This is Argal Robertson pupil, where the pupils are small, irregular margin. So involvement of a bilateral, asymmetrical, retina are sensitive to light, pupil are small in size and irregular in shape. Light reflex is absent, but near reflex is present, means accommodation reflex is preserved and it will dilate poorly with midriatics like atropine. Physosmic stigmine may cause a further constriction. So this is characteristic in an AR pupil. So it is very simple AR pupil accommodation reaction present and pupillary reaction absent. That is the way you can remember. So when you throw the light, so light reflex is absent pupil does not react to light, but on accommodation, pupil will react to accommodation means pupil will constrict. This is typical in Argyle Robertson pupil. Sorry, absolutely sorry. Argyle Robertson pupil, a small irregular pupil, while in myotonic it is dilated and there's a poor response to light and convergence. While here, there is no reaction to light, but it reacts to accommodation. And classical example of AR pupil is syphilis and diabetes. While here, myotonic pupil will constrict with a weak pilocarpine. And in, we already mentioned, home edis pupil will be associated with reduced tendon reflex like knee and ankle will be reduced. And there will be associated orthostatic hypotension. Same is soon here. At your leisure time, you can go through. In Gun, Marcus Gun pupil, or we call relative afferent pupillary defect, RAPD, that can be demonstrated by swinging flat flashlight. Also known as Marcus Gun pupil test, used to compare between direct and consensual reflex. It is performed by equal exposure of light to each eye. Normally, both pupils should be of the same size and should be constricted. Abnormal if the pupil dilates, if the light is shown. Very clear that in a normal person, when you throw the light in one eye, both pupils will constrict. And when you swing the light from one eye to another eye, Again, both pupils should constrict. While in a person who has got a relative afferent pupillary de defect, or we call Marcus Gun pupil, when you throw the light on the affected eye, that side pupil will dilate instead of constriction. That means that side pupil is having Marcus Gun pupil, we call as a relative afferent pupillary defect. And this will be by swinging flashlight test or we call Marcus gun test. You can see here in a normal person when you throw the light, both people will constrict. When you bring it in the center, both people will dilate. Again, you throw it the light on the opposite eye, both people will constrict. This will be normal. In what we call is a afferent pupillary defect. Now suppose here if you see, this is a normal eye, this is abnormal eye. Now, when you throw the light, both pupil constrict. When you bring it in the center, both pupil will dilate. Now, when you are throwing the light on an abnormal eye, that pupil will dilate instead of constriction. That means this pupil is abnormal. Same thing when can be seen in an abnormal eye. Suppose this pupil is dilated. Now, when you are throwing the light in a normal eye, this pupil does not constrict. When you bring it in the center, this still remains dilated. When you throw the light on that eye, pupil still remain dilated. 
means there is an efferent pupillary defect with fixed and dilated pupil and that will be very very common along with third cranial nerve palsy so in a third cranial nerve palsy pupil will remain dilated and fixed whether on direct or indirect pupillary reflex so thank you very much for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me i am extremely sorry that i am not able to show you those now i'll try and show you those particular different types of anisocoria so i'll try and show you that So I'll start with anisocoria. It can be divided into three groupings. First is abnormally large pupil. This is obvious in normal lighting, but less so with the lights off because the other normal pupil dilates. Next is an abnormally small pupil. This may not be visible in normal lighting, but with the lights off becomes obvious due to dilation of the normal pupil. Finally is pupil asymmetry up to two millimeters that doesn't change in light or dark. Both pupils change size, but the relative difference remains the same. This is present in up to 20% of normal people and termed physiological anisocoria. Both eyes respond normally to light. Back to the abnormally large pupil, termed a madriasis. The autonomic nervous system controls pupil movement with constriction supplied by the parasympathetic fibres which travel with the third cranial nerve. Loss of the parasympathetic signal causes the pupil to dilate. Look therefore for diplopia or ptosis to suggest a third nerve palsy. This can be caused by berry aneurysm compressing the third nerve, which can accompany and occasionally precede subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here, the affected right eye is dilated down and out with a ptosis. A dilated pupil without ptosis or diplopia is unlikely to arise from a ptosis, third nerve palsy. See the video on third nerve and palsy. Downwards and outwards. Another cause may be a dystonic pupil. This is characterised by a dilated pupil with little response to light, but which may slowly constrict to accommodative effort and relax slowly as well. Aedes pupil is presumed to be post-viral denervation of the pupil sphincter and is common in young women. Slit lamp examination may reveal segmental paralysis and flattening of the pupil border, giving rise to a pupil with an irregular shape. There may also be a vermiform movement of the non-paralysed sections of the iris, literally a worm-like constriction effort. Aedes pupil is confirmed by testing with dilute pilocarpine 0.125% eye drops, which shows constriction within 20 minutes. But this denervation supersensitivity usually takes some weeks to develop after the onset of the Aedes pupil. Although a tonic pupil is usually idiopathic, they may also arise in diabetes, giant cell arteritis and syphilis, where they are usually bilateral, small and termed argyle robertson pupils. Blunt trauma to the eye may tear the pupil sphincter and cause a permanently dilated pupil, clinically similar in appearance to an Aedes pupil. Diplopia after trauma is suggestive of a blowout fracture. Acutely look for an associated high femur, and later for angle recession or retinal dialysis. Previous eye surgery may also have damaged the pupil. Acute glaucoma features a fixed mid-dilated pupil with brow ache, blurred vision, and nausea or vomiting. The cornea is hazy upon slit lamp examination with a very high intraocular pressure. Finally, the commonest cause of a dilated pupil is exposure to dilating drugs. Examples include the eye drops atropine, cyclopentlate and tropicamide. Atropine may dilate the pupil for up to two weeks. 
Gardeners may inadvertently expose themselves to atropine when cutting back the deadly nightshade or belladonna plant. They present with a dilated pupil, blurred vision and slight photophobia. The pupil is widely dilated and doesn't respond to pilocarpine 1%, but does resolve over a few days. Now, to the abnormally small pupil. Autonomic control of pupil dilation is by the oculosympathetic pathway. This arises in the hypothalamus, descends the brainstem and cervical spinal cord, ascends the cervical sympathetic chain and carotid plexus, and passes through the cavernous venous sinus with the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Damage along this pathway is termed a Horner's syndrome and features a small pupil or meiosis, slight ptosis, and a loss of sweating or anhydrosis on one side of the face. Confirmatory testing with apraclonidine drops reverses the anisocoria and often the ptosis too. See the video on Horner syndrome for more details. Causes of a Horner syndrome include carotid artery dissection, which is both life-threatening and treatable with anticoagulation. Other causes of a small pupil are current or previous iritis and current or previous pilocarpine eye drops. Some key points once more. Anisocoria may arise due to a lesion impairing the efferent sympathetic or parasympathetic pathway to the eye, or due to factors within the eye itself. The pupil should be examined in both light and dark with distance fixation. Ask about eye trauma or surgery, use of eye drops and gardening. With a dilated pupil, check for ptosis, diplopia and response to dilute and 1% pilocarpine. With a small pupil, confirm Horner syndrome with apraclonidine drops and investigate further urgently. To criticise... In this case, the pathway is the affected one. In normal illumination, the affected pupil is more dilated than the normal pupil on the right, as indicated by the blue circles. When light is shown onto the good eye, the pupil constricts, but there is no consensual reflex in the left eye. The right pupil dilates a little, but there is no reaction in the left pupil. In fact, the, the affected pupil does react, but so slowly that it usually cannot be observed during a normal test. Once again, the pupil constricts to light, but there is still no visible consensual reflex. After a few seconds, both pupils look similar because the normal pupil dilated in the absence of a light stimulus. When light is shown onto the affected eye, the pupil does not constrict, but there is a consensual reflex. The right pupil dilates a little, but the left pupil stays dilated. Again, the affected pupil does not constrict, but there is still a consensual reflex. Let's take another look. Instant direct constriction on the right, no consensual constriction on the left. Instant consensual reflex on the right, no direct constriction on the left. Note that both pupils look similar when not illuminated. They look identical in the dark since they are both dilated. The tonic pupil and the swinging light test. Like in the light reflex test, the normal pupil constricts to direct and consensual light, but there is no response at all in the left affected pupil. tonic pupil and the near test. The pupils are at a resting state, not accommodating, while the patient is looking at the distance target. 
The eyes converge and the pupils constrict when the patient is looking at the near target. The pupils relax and enlarge, not accommodating any more, when the patient is looking back at the distance target. The holmes addy syndrome therefore does not affect the near response. Hi. Motor supply of pupil movements is by the autonomic nervous system, with the sympathetic nervous system supplying the dilation and the parasympathetic system controlling constriction. A defect in the sympathetic supply to the eye, also called an oculosympathetic palsy, is Horner's syndrome. It makes the affected pupil smaller or myotic, causing the pupils to be unequal in size. This pupillary size difference is termed an isochoria. Here, the right pupil is slightly smaller than the left. When the lights are switched off, this anisochoria becomes more obvious as the normal left pupil dilates. The affected right pupil may also dilate, but more slowly. This is called a dilation lag. The anisochoria may therefore be greatest a few seconds after switching off the room lights. Another feature of Horner's, illustrated here, is an upper and lower lid ptosis, making the upper and lower lid slightly closer together and making the eye appear smaller. The patient may also notice a loss of sweating on one side of the forehead or face, called anhydrosis. We therefore have a triad of ptosis, meiosis and anhydrosis. If the Horner's syndrome is congenital, or occasionally if long-standing, then iris heterochromia may also be noted, the affected iris being lighter in colour than the other eye. Horner's syndrome can be confirmed pharmacologically by use of apoclonidine 0.5%, commercially available as iopidine drops. First, measure the pupil sizes. This is readily achieved by taking a quick photo with a digital camera. Then, instill a single drop of apoclonidine in each eye. After one hour, re-examine the pupils. Horner syndrome is confirmed if the anisochoria is reversed. Since apoclonidine has no effect on the normal pupil, but dilates the affected pupil. The ptosis may also disappear. Care is needed with infants under six months as they have been reported to have become very lethargic after this test. An alternative test is a cocaine 4% test. Here, a single drop is instilled in each eye and the eyes re-examined after one hour. The cocaine dilates the normal pupil but has little or no effect on the Horner's pupil. The anisochoria is therefore increased, most noticeably in light conditions. Having now diagnosed a Horner syndrome, we need to try and locate the cause. This is divided into three groups along the oculosympathetic pathway. Central, preganglionic and postganglionic. It does not cross sides along its entire course. The central pathway arises at the hypothalamus, then travels down the brainstem and cervical cord to synapse at the ciliospinal centre of budge, between C8 and T2. Central Horner syndromes are usually not an isolated clinical finding. Instead, they are part of a wider clinical picture, featuring other brainstem or spinal symptoms and signs. Causes of central lesions include stroke, tumour, syrinx, vascular malformations, trauma or demyelination. An example is lateral medullary or Wallenberg syndrome, caused by posterior inferior cerebellar artery ischemia. This features dysphagia, analgesia in the ipsilateral face and contralateral trunk and extremities, ipsilateral cerebellar ataxia, and rotary nystagmus. Skew deviation may occur with vertical diplopia. Suspected central lesions are usually investigated by imaging with MRI. From the ciliospinal centre, the second order neurone leaves the spine and joins the sympathetic chain close to the lung apex and passes up to synapse at the superior cervical ganglion in the neck. This preganglionic pathway is damaged in a number of ways. The T1 nerve root may be damaged at birth with an associated brachial plexus palsy causing hand weakness termed a clumpy palsy. Compression at the pulmonary apex may arise from a pancose lung tumour or breast cancer and also TB, cervical rib or vascular anomalies. There may be associated shoulder tip or arm pain where the brachial plexus is affected. This presentation would indicate the need for a chest x-ray and appropriate referral. 
Next surgery or trauma may also injure this preganglionic part of the pathway. The postganglionic pathway passes from the superior cervical ganglion onto the carotid plexus. It descends with the internal carotid artery to the cavernous sinus. Here, the fibres join the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, passing through the superior orbital fissure into the orbital apex and become the long ciliary nerve before entering the eye. Sweating is not usually affected by postganglionic Horner's lesions due to division of the nerve supply at the carotid bifurcation. A Horner's syndrome associated with unexplained neck or facial pain should be considered as a carotid dissection and promptly investigated, usually by MR angiography. A Horner's syndrome associated with the gaze palsy should lead to investigation of the cavernous venous sinus, usually with MRI. Cluster headache often features transient Horner's syndrome during the attack. Men are affected six times more than women. Features of cluster headache are severe headache around the eye or temple associated with lacrimation and redness, blocked or watering nose and sweating all on one side. The attacks last for 30 minutes to two hours, are often one to two times per day and after four to eight weeks they stop, on average for around a year. They're both debilitating and treatable with verapamil and steroids effective for prophylaxis. Eyed pupils are small in normal illumination. They are sometimes irregular in shape and unequal in size. In the dark, the pupils are also small, constricted. The light reflex test. When the light is shone into the right pupil, there is no direct or consensual reflex visible. There is no direct and consensual dilation when the light is removed from the right pupil. The pupils are already constricted and they do not constrict any further with the light. There is also no direct or consensual reflex visible when light is shone into the left pupil. There is again no direct or consensual dilation when the light is removed from the left pupil. The Argyle, Robertson pupil with a swinging light test. When light is shone into the right pupil, no visible response can be observed from both pupils. There is also no response when the light is moved to the left pupil. Both pupils are still small. Note that the pupils don't dilate when the light is moved. It is also the case in complete darkness. The near test. The pupils are small in normal illumination and they constrict slightly more in response to the near target. But the pupils remain small when the patients are looking back at the distance target. or RAPD. This is also sometimes referred to as Marcus Gunn pupil. First, we will compare its clinical appearance with that of normal pupils and also that of a complete afferent pupil defect. To avoid pupil constriction whilst accommodating, ask the patient to fix on a distant object throughout your examination. Look for equal pupil sizes and check again with the lights off. A nisocoria is not a feature of an afferent defect. Now check for a reaction to light in each eye. Again, with the lights off. Here, the normal pupils constrict briskly, then relax a little. They dilate again after the light is removed. Now swing the light from eye to eye, quickly, but pausing on each eye for around two seconds. In the normal patient, the pupils will constrict, then relax a little each time the light is swung to them. Now a patient with a relative afferent defect. The pupils will be equal in size in both light and dark. Both pupils will react to light, although sometimes a slower response is noted when light is shone on the affected side. With the swinging light test, the RAPD now becomes obvious. On the affected side, both pupils dilate when the light is swung across. 
Here, the left side is affected. You will miss an ROPD if you do not do the swinging light test, as it is only by comparing the relative strengths of the signals reaching the brain from the eyes that the abnormality is detected. Finally, with a complete afferent pupil defect, there is no pupil reaction to light shone on the affected side. Due to crossing of nerve fibres at the optic chiasm, an ROPD localises pathology to the visual pathway before the chiasm, that is, the optic nerve or retina. Some examples of pathologies causing an RAPD are large retinal detachment, central retinal artery or ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, optic nerve ischemia, optic neuritis, optic nerve compression or asymmetric glaucoma. It should be noted that an RAPD is not caused by either cataract or vitreous hemorrhage and when associated with amblyopia it is usually mild. Therefore a definite RAPD in these cases should prompt to look for another cause of visual loss.